Taylor Poor is a staff attorney for the Office of the Appellate Defender. She was previously a staff attorney with the Staten Island Office of the Criminal Defense Practice at the Legal Aid Society. Thank you for joining me, Taylor. Thank you so much for having me. So you represented Lasu Kuyate, who he was 19 at the time of his arrest. Can you tell us why police pulled him over and what led up to the search of his vehicle? Sure. So the case started with two officers pulling the car over in Staten Island. They claimed they pulled the car over because the windows were tinted and because the driver didn't make a turn signal. Um, and then they said they smelled marijuana, which they used as an excuse to get everyone out of the car and search their pockets and search the entire car. Um, and obviously the reason that we're here is that the two lead officers on the case were both wearing body cameras. Um, so after they've been searching the car for a few minutes, um, finding nothing and saying out loud on their cameras that the car looked clean, one of them says, we've got to find something, you know what I mean? Uh, and his body camera turns mm -hmm. off. What he doesn't seem to realize is that his partner is standing on the opposite side of the car in the perfect position for his body camera to capture the first officer putting something on the car seat where the, he then finds a joint after his camera turns back on. And that's clear as day in, in the body camera footage that the um, I, I believe the New York Times had actually published, correct? I think it is. Uh, of course, the NYPD watched the same videos that I just described and they cleared the officers of any wrongdoing. And as far as I know, those officers are still making arrests. So clearly they have a different perspective on what the videos show. Mm -hmm. What else was noteworthy um, on that body camera? I wish we could show it for viewers, but what else could um, you see from the second officer's body camera? Maybe your client at the time? So um, my client is clearly aware um, from the video, from the footage, um, that something is is happening and something that the officers are planting something in his car. So um, he is narrating and he's, um, he's telling the viewers that the officers are putting something in his car. Um, and actually, you can um, see from cell phone footage um, that kind of complements the body-worn camera. Um, that just before the officer who finds the blunt turns his camera back on, um, he's got some uh, glassine baggies that he puts in the center console. Mm -hmm. um, then he, he turns his camera back on um, and he finds uh, this blunt in the exact same place where both officers had previously searched on camera found nothing mm -hmm. um, and then what he was shown mm -hmm. on his body on his partner's body worn camera putting something on the seat so your client was given a uh, bail and he was actually held in jail for two weeks he then came back to court 10 times before prosecutors dismissed the charges if the video was clear that these officers who kept suspiciously turning their cameras on and off that they were planting drugs in his car, why did it take 10 times of a court appearance for them to dismiss the charges? So what's, one of the things that's really amazing at this case, in this case was that the, the video footage that I just described from the arrest shown on the body-worn cameras, recorded on the body-worn cameras, was turned over as evidence from the prosecutor's office and they got it from the police officers. Um, so the prosecutor's office had the video before we did, um, and they were perfectly capable of watching it themselves, but they continued to prosecute the case. And as you said, my client made um, many, many court appearances you know, to keep on taking time off from work. Um, and the prosecutors were making a plea offer that involved jail time. Um, and because I was a relatively new lawyer at the time, I had the time to watch both officers' videos all the way through multiple times. Um, which was how it became clear that the piece missing from Officer Erickson's camera was shown on his partner's camera. Um, again, the prosecutors had the same video. The video we got was from them. Um, it's it's really just incredible to me that um, my client had to keep on coming back to court to, to fight the case. Um, I think one another really important part of this case and, and something to keep in mind is that body-worn camera footage is not turned over at the first court date. Um, so many mm -hmm. people just aren't keep, able to keep coming back to court for 12 court dates and keep taking that time off from work to fight their cases. 
Um, and there's enormous pressure to take a plea offer, especially if the plea offer doesn't involve jail time, and especially if the prosecutors are asking for bail, as they did in this case. Um, and so it's just, I think we, we have to imagine just how many more videos like this there are out there that just never get turned over and never get seen. So at what point did you actually get the footage in the process? Was it at the beginning? It was um, definitely after um, the, the prosecutor had asked for bail um, and after my client had spent two weeks in jail. Um, I was actually the, the second lawyer who was assigned to the case and I think I was the first lawyer who was able to actually sit down and watch the, the body cam footage in full. Um, so Mr. Criate was eventually able to um, pay bail, but, uh, but he, was still, he was still required to pay money to the court in order to be released from jail in order to keep coming back and fighting the case. Um, and so I think another of the, the most, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I was just going to point out that, you know, I've, I've had to experience prosecutors who uh, never even check the evidence. They don't look at the videos until the defense attorney actually watches it and points out certain things. And they're like, oh, well, maybe I should be taking a look at this. So they're giving you their actual recommendation for sentencing before they even look through the evidence. Do you think that that was the case here? I think that's um, the most plausible explanation for what happened. Um, but I, I mean, I will say that um, another very disappointing thing about this case was that even once we, once the video had been played during the suppression hearing and it was, um, it was out there, it was everybody had watched the same footage in court. Um, it was disappointing how even then, when we did have a situation where we had video like this, it was still so difficult to make that record um, and to have anyone involved in the prosecution of the case admit any form of wrongdoing, which has not happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what happened during that suppression hearing that you just brought up? Um, so the, the video that we've been talking about, the body-worn camera footage, um, was actually presented by the prosecution um, as evidence that the search in this case was legal. Um, and because there were technical difficulties in um, getting the video to play, uh, there, the delays just continued in the case, and um, the, the, the prosecution continued to make this offer that included jail. Um, so my client continued to return to court and wait for the chance to have everyone um, in the courtroom see what had happened and see um, what had happened on that video. Um, so we we sat there for 10, 12 court dates uh, waiting for the video to be played in its entirety. And that's not uncommon. I mean, it's it's incredibly common for adjournments to, uh, for, for delays to happen in cases because there isn't a courtroom available for the hearing. Um, there isn't technology available to play the video that's um, that's required as evidence, and it's it's all just a, it creates more pressure for anybody who's um, who's being forced to come back to court again and again to take that plea and to admit guilt in cases where they know they've done nothing wrong. Well, I can't imagine these two officers um, being able to to. I, I can't imagine why they're still employed, number one, because any, any case that they're involved in, I mean, easily need to be tossed. I mean, clearly with this example of your, of your client, um, so I'm not even sure how they can even function in their role as officers when everything they essentially touch will be tainted. I, anyways, Taylor Poor, thank you so much, staff attorney with the Office of the Appellate Defender. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me.